Hey, and welcome to Behind the Knife. I am Michael Vu. I'm going to be one of the new voices uh, and faces of BTK this academic year, and I am really excited to be introducing you guys to our brand new YouTube video series all on basic bedside procedures. This first episode is all about the humble chest tube. So first things first, let's go shopping in the hospital supply room, get everything you could possibly need. I'll talk about the equipment now, but if you're short on time, you can skip to the procedural steps in the playback bar below. And I will list all the equipment in the video description. In the room, you should have a mayo stand or similar surface that you can stage all of your equipment on. Hopefully at minimum, you grabbed a knife like this 15 blade and a chest tube. And if you're in an emergency situation, that's actually all you need to just get the thing in, that and your finger. But if you have the time, you should be getting some more things, including this water seal suction chamber like this atrium device. You want two pairs of long, skinny, curved clamps. Classically, these would be Kelly's. And for any procedure, I always recommend you have a generous pack of gauze. And unless you're in a trauma or crash situation, you should have something to prep and drape with. So here I've got a stick of chlorhexidine and a thyroid drape. In a similar vein, unless the patient's already anesthetized, you should bring some local with you, as well as a syringe and needles to draw it up and inject it. I like bringing the emergency room laceration tray from my hospital's ED because it includes the syringe and the needles I need, and it also has some extra towels and sponges. You'll need something to sew your chest tube in with, so I brought with me an O silk on a cutting needle. Um, you'll want it to be pretty big, like an O. If it's too small, you may break it when you're tying with it. Uh, and you'll need a pair of needle drivers as well, which comes in my laceration tray. If you brought suture on a Keith needle, then you may not need your needle drivers. Last and not least, you'll need some PPE, not pictured here, so grab some headgear, eye pro, a mask, and a gown and gloves. A quick note about chest tube sizes, you know, we used to put some monster chest tubes into people, like 40 French. These are very painful, and most modern research has shown that smaller chest tubes in the range of 24 to 28 French are more than sufficient for most applications. Obviously, your clinical judgment should prevail, and if you know you're draining a really thick, nasty empyema, you may need to go bigger. For any procedure, you should always consider patient positioning before you start. So, lower the head of the bed until it is flat, and raise the entire bed until it's at a level that is comfortable for you to work in. Slide the patient over to the edge of the bed that you'll be working on, and have an assistant stand cephalad to you on the side that you're working on to hold that arm up and out of the way. Alternatively, you could put a uh, restraint on that arm and hook it up to the bed if you don't have an assistant. Get the patient's gown out of the way, and take this time to really examine your procedural site. Remember, your target is going to be the fourth or fifth intercostal space at the mid-axillary line. The best landmark to use in a male would be the nipple, and in a woman, it'd be the inframammary fold, or the breast crease. And with the preparation out of the way, it's time to gown and glove up. All right, all sterile. Again, unless you're in a crash situation, go ahead and start prepping and draping the field, keeping in mind where your landmark is gonna be so that you're gonna be able to access it. And uh, for demonstration purposes, I'm putting the thyroid drape on here upside down on purpose uh, to show you guys that if you don't have a lot of drape at the foot of the bed with whatever drape you decide to use, you can use the water seal suction canisters, uh, sterile sheeting that it comes in That'll give you some extra sterile field at the, at the foot of the bed. I do like to open the atrium sterilely at the very beginning, so it's easier for me to hook everything up when I'm done. And one really important thing not to forget is to fill the water seal chamber with the layer of water that it needs to actually work. So in the atrium, you take out this little tube of water on the back and you, you squeeze it into the blue uh, nozzle. Uh, I've relied on nurses to do this for me before, uh, and they remember like 99% of the time, but uh, every so often they'll forget, and that's, that's dangerous. By the way, if you want a short video on how to read and use the Atrium uh, water seal suction device, uh, leave a comment below. At this point, we continue with opening the rest of our equipment. Um, pretty helpful to have an assistant with you to help you do that. If you're alone, you really have to plan out um, in advance opening all this stuff uh, on a sterile field that you create before you gown and glove up. 
If your patient is uh, really cooperative or unconscious, you can open up your stuff on the sterile field you've created kind of next to their legs. Um, I find this really helpful because there's a lot of room there, but if the patient is a little jumpy, I would not do that because their legs could move and, and bump your equipment. The last bit of prep, I promise, but make sure you clamp the extracorporeal end of the chest tube. Otherwise, when you put it in, you'll have a mess on the floor. All right, with the prep out of the way, let's get down to the good stuff. So draw up some local and get to injecting. These are very painful procedures, so you wanna make sure that the patient has adequate anesthesia. My technique is to first start by making a little skin wheel uh, with the local, and then I kind of drive the needle down until I hit the rib. Once I've hit the rib, I inject the periosteum right there. Then I maneuver the needle kind of over the rib and go a little deeper until I've hit the pleura, and I will inject liberally there. Finally, I slowly withdraw the needle and uh, inject on my way out to get the entire tract. Wait about five minutes and then do a little skin test with a sharp instrument to make sure the patient can't feel. And finally, we're ready to get to cutting. So feel again for that intercostal space. Make sure that your trajectory is gonna be taking you over the rib and then make that incision. Should be two to three centimeters transversely just over that rib. Now pick up that second pair of Kelly's you brought with you and insert it into the incision. Now apply firm but steady pressure down toward the chest wall over that rib until you feel you pop through the parietal pleura. And notice I'm holding the Kelly's out high on the neck of the clamp and I'm bracing the clamp with my left hand. Uh, that will help prevent you from diving the clamp too deep into the lung. Our sim man actually makes a really good sound. That's actually good. Back up the Kelly so that just the tines are in the hole, and then give a generous spread as you withdraw to dilate that tract. Put your finger through that tract and follow it all the way down to the pleural cavity. And if you're not in the cavity, you know you didn't make it through the pleura. Sweep the underside of the chest wall 360 degrees to make sure the lung isn't stuck up against the chest wall somewhere. Now take that pair of Kelly's and clamp the end of the chest tube like this. Notice that it's through the last hole and the clamps are roughly parallel with the chest tube. Use those clamps to guide the chest tube through the tract over the rib. And then you can use the clamp to help you guide the chest tube either apically, that is toward the head, or basally. Apical chest tubes are suited for draining air while basal chest tubes are suited for draining fluid. Advance the chest tube until that last drainage hole is all the way in the body, and then put it in another three to four centimeters just for good measure. You don't want the chest tube slipping out of the body later and one of those holes open to the air. Unclamp the extracorporeal end of the chest tube and then attach it to the Christmas tree adapter on the atrium. Make sure the clamp on the tubing is also unclamped. Home stretch now, all you need to do is sew this thing in. So take your suture and a needle driver there are a lot of ways to sew in chest tubes. You could put in a nice U-stitch, uh, which allows the person removing the chest tube to use that same stitch to close the skin. But what I'm showing you here is gonna be a really simple uh, anchoring stitch uh, that does not have that functionality. So I throw the needle through the bottom part of that incision so that when I tie the knot there, it serves to partially close up that incision, make that skin snug up against the tube. And uh, then we just cut the needle off. If you want to look slick, you can use the cutting needle itself, but a pair of scissors works just fine. Tie down a strong knot with the skin to cinch that skin up against the chest tube and anchor the stitch to the skin. And then take the two tails of the suture and wrap them once around the chest tube each, and then tie them down onto the chest tube. Make sure that you are making that knot plenty tight. Uh, don't pull too hard or you'll break the stitch, but definitely want to have the suture grabbing onto that chest tube. It's helpful to know how to tie a slipping knot so you can just push that knot down onto the tube. And then I wrap the remaining free ends uh, around the tube several times each, and then I tie another uh, nice tight knot down onto the tube. Now you can dress the chest tube how you want. Some people will put some zero form over it uh, before applying a little gauze sponge like uh, I've done right here. I just cut a little slit in that gauze. And then you can put uh, your tape of choice, uh, which a lot of people like foam tape for this. And that's it. Hand the atrium to a bedside nurse or assistant who can help you hook it up to wall suction, uh, clean up your sharps, and get the drapes off. And one thing to remember uh, for either yourself to do or for the nurse to do is to reinforce the Christmas tree connections with some tape. So notice here, Dr. Franco is using some skinny strips of tape 
and kind of spiraling it around the connection. He'll use a few strips of tape to do this, and we like to do it this way instead of just wrapping the whole thing in one thick wad of tape, because if you do it that way, then you won't be able to see the actual connection if you need to troubleshoot it later. And there you have it, how to place a chest tube. Hey, I really hope you guys enjoyed this video or learned something from it. Uh, if you liked the video, please hit that like button down below. It really helps us out. We're a small crew here at BTK, and videos like this do take a little while to, to make. So every like just motivates us to keep doing them for you. Uh, and better yet, if you want to be notified the next time we release another YouTube entry, hit that subscribe button down below as well. If you stick around next week, we do plan on continuing this series, and the next episode is going to be all about central lines. And hey, was there something you would have done differently than we showed in the video? Or was there some nuance on chest tubes that we didn't get to fully cover that maybe you want us to cover in one of our future videos? Like uh, how to read and use the atrium chest drainage device, or why you might want to put a chest tube in someone in the first place? Uh, leave all sorts of questions like that down below in the comments field. We read each and every one of them. We love getting ideas for next videos or getting feedback from you guys. And until next time, dominate the day.